So welcome to algebra. <laughs> okay, so then we're doing section 2.1, the rectangular coordinate system. So now, uh, rectangular coordinate system. It can help to know a little bit of the language and, hi and history of this, so I'm going to try and, and, and give you sort of a historical point of view. Is that <clears throat> to now, in our class anyway, we've been talking about the reals, which we denote with boldface R. <coughs> so to now, it's been conceivable that you could have just imagined the reals as just a bag of numbers, a set that's got, got numbers in it. Uh, but now, in this section, and increasingly, we're going to consider uh, the reals visually as being uh, a line, part of a line. So this line is drawn horizontally. This line extends infinitely far in both directions. It extends all the way to the left and all the way to the right. However, I'd like for you to note that uh, what what may be different than your previous exposure to this is that I'm only drawing an arrow on one side. Okay. So can anyone tell me why I'm only drawing an arrow on one side? What's the meaning of that? Any takers? Well, in the end, in the end, part of the convention of the reals is that for one thing we know that given any two reals we can compare them and we can say well for example 5 is greater than 3 5 and 3 are both reals and we can say 5 is greater than 3 so if we were to draw 5 and 3 on the line which one would be further to the right 5 would be further to the right because it, it is the convention that the increasing direction is to the right so now I'll, I'll pose my question again. Why do you suppose that I've drawn just one arrow? On the right. That signifies that on my, on my drawing, to the right is the increasing direction. Okay, that's what it means. So in a physics, physics class where you're dealing with, you know, trains leaving Boston and whatever okay it may be the case that in your particular drawing the increasing direction is to the left okay that's the significance of the arrow and when 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 you're doing physics problems the way you draw it can kind of depend on matters depend on how things are physically situated but when you're doing something abstract the increasing direction is always to the right by convention and the arrow signifies this so in, in Ms. Harris's seventh grade class, often when you drew the line, you drew an arrow on both ends. Okay, And that, I, I don't know why they do that. I wish they wouldn't. But I suppose that the, way they, the reason why is to remind you that the line, in fact, extends infinitely far in both directions. Okay. But the arrow indicates the direction of increase. So a particular point uh, is singled out on the line, the place where zero occurs. <clears throat> Notably, um, that zero cuts the line into two pieces, the piece that's on the left and the piece that's on the right. So we have names for, for both these pieces. What's the name for the piece that's on the left? Or the name for numbers that occur in the piece on the left? Negative. negative right? So these are said to be negative. And these others, positive. So the zero cuts the line into, into two pieces. Now, associated with this line is a ruler. And by that, I don't mean an aristocrat. Okay? I mean uh, an autocrat. I mean uh, a linear measuring device okay? that, that we all have agreed on, and it's the same for all of us. So specifically, if we were to select this point right here on the line, then we can measure the, what the ruler says from zero to that point. 
And if this happened, if the ruler happened to read three, if the ruler happened to read three, then this would be positive three, because it's three, which happens to be on the positive side. Whereas if we were to measure the distance from zero to that point, and if the ruler was reading seven, then what's that point? Negative seven. Because its distance is seven to zero. That, that distance is seven, but it's on the left side, so it's negative seven. Okay. Any questions about, about that? Okay, so we're okay with this? Good. So that's the, that's the line. Now, what today's topic is that we want to talk about, well, instead of a one-dimensional object, an object in which there's only one direction to travel, to the right, to the left and right, we want to be able to have a two-dimensional object where there's two dimensions to travel. It is denoted with R superscript 2. And in this case, in this case, it is one copy of the reels. So, so far it's just like the above. We have this one copy of the reels. And it is increasing to the right. And now we're going to have a second copy of the reels, and instead of being horizontal, it's going to be vertical. And notably, on this vertical copy of the reels, I have not yet indicated the direction of increase for the vertical copy. What is the standard convention for the direction of increase for the vertical copy? Up. Going up is the increasing direction. So now, that, re that, that needs a little bit of comment. So the horizontal axis increases to the right, the vertical increases going up. Okay, that is the universal convention in mathematics. However, in other disciplines, in other disciplines, that is not the convention. A notable exception that we all have to deal with all the time is computer science, for example. So the reason why is because, in, I guess in a, in a certain sense, computer science is the, one of, one of the parents of computer science in the end is the television. Okay, because you've got to have a computer monitor to, to do stuff. <laughs> okay, so back in the day, when Farnsworth was making the first screen, the way it actually works is that in the, in the top left here, in the top left of the screen, that's the first pixel that gets illuminated when the screen is being refreshed. The next one is the pixel to its immediate right, and then to its right, 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 all the way across. And then the beam comes back and goes one row down and does that one, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one, and then the beam comes all the way back, this one, this one, this one. So it's one row at a time. So in time, as time proceeds, if you, if you, know, if you were in super slow-mo, you'd see the individual pixels getting illuminated. And they get in, in time, the rows go downward. So the second dimension, the increasing dimension in computer science, at least on a screen, is down. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm just letting you know that because there's, there's perfectly good reasons to have a different convention, but this is the convention in mathematics. Now, <coughs> this is a horizontal copy of the reels and a vertical copy of the reels. There's a horizontal zero and there's a vertical zero, which is to say, just like this one has a zero, that one has a zero, and that one has a zero. And the convention is that we arrange the horizontal and vertical copies so that the two zeros occur at the same place which is to say that that point right there is where the horizontal copy has its zero and where the vertical copy has its zero. So because both zeros occur there and because that's important, we're gonna give, the, we're gonna give that a specific name. And what are we gonna call this? Origin. The origin, which is where everything begins, right? <laughs> that's where zero is for the horizontal copy and for the vertical copy. And then, in a matter of backward continuity, we're going to now start calling this the origin also, when we're talking about lines. So, also, as a matter of 
continuity of ideas, we're going to now start referring to this as the real line, and we're going to refer to this as the real plane. Now, just like the origin in the line breaks the space into, <coughs> into pieces, the origin in the plane also breaks the space into four pieces. In the line, there's two pieces. In the plane, four pieces. So these four pieces are referred to as quadrants because there's four of them. And for reasons historical, they are numbered with Roman numerals. So this is quadrant one. This is quadrant two. This is quadrant three. And this is quadrant four. So one and and then counterclockwise they increment. So now, I don't really care if you know the quadrants by number. As far as I'm concerned, when I ask you which quadrant something is in, you can say top left and that's perfectly fine by me. Okay. Because, I mean, the, th the thing is, is that, you know, if you want to generalize this further, like in three-dimensional space, then that would mean that you have a you have one copy of the reels going that way, one copy of the reels going that way, and now you need it another direction that's, that's at a right angle to both of them, so let's make it coming out of the page, so coming up this way. <laughs> and then now, space is cut into eight pieces, and those are called octants. And who even knows what order those are in? Right? Who knows? It's ridiculous. So, <clears throat> any question about what we have here? Okay. Now, uh, in order to get, in order to name a point on the line, I, I explained how we did it. We have a ruler, you measure the distance to the origin, and then if it happens to be on the right side, you say that it's positive that. If it happens to be on the left side, negative that. Now, what about if we select a point on the plane? And remember, conceptually, this plane is the whole thing. It extends out infinitely far. So what if, what if we select this point in particular right here? So that's a point. And now we want to name it. We want to give it a name. We want to measure its position. But what we actually have is we have two copies of the reels. And it is absolutely forbidden for you to remove your horizontal ruler from the horizontal line. You can't do that. You can't, you can't move it down here. You can't turn it at an angle. Oh, definitely not an angle. That would be bad. So the, the recourse that we have is we'll say, OK, we'll start at this point, and we will travel parallel to the vertical axis and arrive on the horizontal axis. Right there. So now that gives us a point on the horizontal axis. And we'll travel from this point to the to the vertical axis parallel to the horizontal axis <coughs> and arrive right there. Now, notably, that point is now on the horizontal axis. So we're, we, it is a legitimate enterprise to use our horizontal ruler. So let's say that we measure it horizontally and we determine that this is A. By the way, uh, so A is a number. Is A positive or is A negative? Is positive. Why is A a positive number? Because it's on the horizontal axis to the right of the horizontal origin. So A is positive. So let's say that now we measure this and we determine that this is B. So B is a number. Is B positive or negative? It's negative. Why is B negative? Because we measured it on the vertical axis, and it's on the negative part of the vertical axis. So B is a negative number. So that tells us our name for this point. The name for this point is A comma B. <clears throat> also, this coordinate system is said to be rectangular. And the reason it's said to be rectangular is that every point on the plane is at the corner of a rectangle. That's why it's called rectangular. There's other manners 
uh, other other styles of coordinate systems <coughs> where things are not on the corners of rectangles, rather they can be located with circles and, and, and other things like that, but that's not what we're talking about today. So any question about this? So, <coughs> um, you know, if you wanted to find the point negative 2, positive 5, then from the origin, you'd travel negative 2 and then positive 5, and that would take you there. So now, these individual axes, because there's two of them, we need names for them so we can disambiguate when we're talking about them. So, the names for this is, this is frequently referred to as the horizontal axis. It's called the horizontal axis because it's situated horizontally. <laughs> this is also referred to as the first axis. Why do you think it's called the first axis? Well, in the end, the real reason is that when you, when you perform measurements, the measurement that's on the horizontal axis goes in the first position. That's the reason why. And then when you want to give the axes symbolic names, this one is, o is almost always called the x-axis. So these three names all mean the same thing. So what are the three names for this one? Vertical. <coughs> Second. Second. And Y. So is there any question about the names? So it's called, this one's referred to as a vertical axis because it's drawn vertically. It's also called the second axis because when you perform measurements, the measurement goes in the second position. And it's also called Y because that, that one's called X, and that's the, and Y is the next letter. <laughs> okay. Why, you, which, which raises the question, why X in the first place? I have no idea. I love trying to figure out math history, and I'm, I, I can't figure out why someone started using X, how that got so, you know, ingrained. Any question about this? Okay. So... <clears throat> Now, uh, as an illustration of the consequences of these, um, definitions, on the line, to remind you, okay, on the line, we can select two points, for example, this point and this point, and I'd like to point out <laughs> that I haven't shown you where the origin is. So in particular, you don't know if A and B are both positive, both negative, one positive, one negative. All that you know is that B is to the right of A. So B is bigger. That's all that you know. And what, what I want to determine is how can we measure that distance d? So what's the formula for the distance between a and b? No, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even sure what delta is. OK, so that, that's the first one. So how about d is b minus a? So OK. So now let's imagine, let's imagine that, that, okay, so in the first place, would B minus A be, be positive or negative? Positive it, for this particular drawing. Why for this particular drawing would B minus A be positive? <coughs> and why is B larger than A? Because it's further to the right. Now, if you could imagine that this was a machine and I could move the parts around, and here's B and I'm wiggling it, okay, and now I'm going to move it over here. Now, if, if, I was to take, if, if we were to take this B and move it over here, B minus A would be negative. And that's not going to work. 
So to, to put this to put this in perspective, let's let's imagine for a moment. Remember the mile marker system in the United States Interstate Highway System tells you, what, you know, it's a it's a it's a prox it's a coordinate system in the end. So let's say that this is not this is not true, but for the sake of argument, let's say that Houston is on mile marker 50, and Dallas is on mile marker 250. And you also need to know that there's a highway that travels north, more or less north-south between Houston and Dallas. So it's on mile marker, Houston's on mile marker 50, Dallas on mile marker 250. What's the distance between Dallas and Houston? 200. According to what I have written here, that would mean that the, Houston, the, the distance from Dallas to Houston <coughs> is negative 200. <laughs> right. If the distance from Dallas to Houston, uh, from Houston to Dallas is 200, then from Dallas to Houston should be also 200, right? <laughs> so how do we fix this? Absolute value. Absolute value. Now it's right. Which is to say, that's the thing that every school child knows, right? If the distance from from point A to point B is five, then, di then the distance from point B to point A is also five. Okay, <clears throat> so now we want to do this on the plane. And now I'm only going to draw the first coordinates, uh, I mean the first quadrant. <coughs> this is a whole plane, but I'm only drawing the first quadrant. So there's two points, there's two points, and this is the line segment connecting them. <clears throat> By the way, the trick to drawing straight lines between two points is to take the two points and make them vertical with respect to you, and then you can draw. <laughs> That's the trick. <laughs> Otherwise, if you leave them like that, you know, I, I, ne I, never, I never hit it. Right. So what we want to do is we want to find the distance, the length of that blue line. And what we actually have is we have a horizontal ruler and we have a vertical ruler. And it is absolutely forbidden to turn this ruler, either one, at an angle. You just can't do it. It's against the rules. So how are we going to turn what we have into a way to measure <coughs> that, that blue length? It's for so we have a horse a ruler that we're allowed to hold horizontally and and on the horizontal axis and we have a ruler that we're allowed to hold vertically on the vertical axis but it is absolutely forbidden to take one of these rulers and do it like that <laughs> against the rules okay so well, we we have to just use the only the only things that we're allowed, and that is okay. I'm going to take this point, and I'm going to follow the vertical axis to the horizontal one. And I'm going to do that here. Okay, and I'm going to do that here. Lots of rectangles showing up because this is a rectangular coordinate system. So now notably, that gave us points on the horizontal <coughs> and vertical axes. So we can measure that and let's say that it measures x1 and this one measures x2. And let's say this one measures y1 and this one y2. So now we have four four measurements. Now this this thing right here is a rectangle. That whole thing is a rectangle. And that means that in particular that's a right angle right there. And that also means that this thing that I'm shading in is a shape that you knew before you got in this class. So what's that? Right? Right triangle. So now, this distance right here 
that we can actually measure. We can measure that one because that's where our ruler is. Is the same as that distance. Is the same as that distance. Right? So all those three distances, one, two, three, are the same. So we can measure this one. We can measure this distance, and that's this distance. So what is this distance right here? What's this distance? Y1 minus Y2? Okay, Y2 minus Y1? That's not quite right. It's almost right. It's not right about it. Absolute value. Now, on this particular picture, which one is the larger? Y2 is the larger because it's further, it's higher. Okay, so Y2 minus Y1 is right on this picture. But if, but if we were to take this point and move it down here, then it wouldn't be right. That's why you need absolute value. Okay, what is this horizontal distance? x2 minus x1, but absolute value. And so now, okay, well, what we really want is that blue length. And that is the long side of a right triangle. Well, what's the fancy name for the long side of a right triangle? Hypotenuse. And what's the, what's the fancy name for the short sides of a right triangle? Less students know these. These are referred to as the legs. So the hypotenuse and the legs. So what we, a what we have a right triangle, and we have the length of each leg, but what we want is the length of the hypotenuse. If only there was some kind of theorem that related the length of the hypotenuse to the length of the legs. <laughs> oh, but that's something that you knew before you got here. Right? So then, if again we refer to this as D, then, the Pythagorean theorem, which you knew before you got here, is d squared is, hypotenuse squared, is the sum of the length of the legs squared. Okay, that's the Pythagorean theorem. Now I'm going to perform an operation. And I want you to tell me two things. First, what is it that I did, and is it legitimate? Now, what did I do? Squared the whole value of x squared minus x1, and y squared, or y2 minus y1 and x2 minus x1. OK. I agree. Took away, uh, Take, well. took away absolute value. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> Is it legitimate to have taken away the absolute value? Yes. Why? Because if you square it, it becomes a positive other way. Right, correct. So let's imagine here for a moment. Suppose that we made a drawing and arranged so that x2 minus x1 was negative 5. Suppose that we did such a drawing then x2 minus x1, that'd be negative 5. We compute absolute value of that, that'd be positive 5. We square that, that would be positive 25. Now suppose that we forget the absolute value and we say, okay, x2 minus x1, that's negative 5. We square negative 5 and get positive 25. So do you observe that the intermediate absolute value actually doesn't <coughs> make any difference? So yes, it is legitimate to do this. And then I'll compute square root of both sides and obtain this. And this last is a formula, the distance formula. And it is expected that from this point forward, you have memorized that formula. <coughs> But I'd like to point out how much the distance formula is literally a direct consequence of the fact that we're saying that we have two linear measuring devices, two rulers, and the Pythagorean theorem. It's an immediate consequence of these things. It's the length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So by way of example,
find the distance from a is equal to 4, negative 7 to b is equal to um, negative 3, uh, 8. Okay, well, the pattern, according to the previous page, will look like this. Is there any question why the pattern looks like this? So there's four slots, one, two, three, four. And the, the, the only real part of the exercise is routing the correct thing into the correct slot. So this first one is the difference in the x's, and this one the difference in the y's. Or, if you like, the difference in the horizontal coordinates, and these the difference in the vertical coordinates. Or these the difference in the first coordinates, those the difference in the second coordinates. So what goes here for... If 4 goes in there, in that slot, then what goes in this one? Three. Negative 3, this other x-coordinate. Okay. And then, negative 7 goes here, a y-coordinate, and 8 here, the other y-coordinate. So is there any question why the wiring diagram looks like that? The difference in the first coordinates, the difference in the second coordinates. <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to perform the substitution. Okay, so then that would be 4 minus uh, negative 7, good, squared, and then plus, uh, no, wait. Negative 3. So minus negative 3. Okay, negative 3. And then negative 7 uh, minus 8. Okay. So someone say it. It's not right. Plus 3. It says minus 3 right there. It's minus, minus negative 3, right? So, now, <clears throat> I want to point something out to you. Okay, The way your mind works is that human beings are exceptionally good at matching patterns. Exceptional. In all of the animal kingdom. Uh, however, so, so the real strategy for, for teaching mathematics is to, is to show how to use that pattern matching and, to, and to, <laughs> sometimes by tricks and sometimes explicitly. But the other thing that's important is also to show you where it can go wrong. This error that I've written is an extremely common error. And in the end, the, the origination of the error is you see this minus, you see that minus, and then that's a copy error because somehow this minus becomes that minus and you copy it and then it gets messed up. Okay, so the way to make sure that you always, always get it right, that you always get it right, is every time that you substitute something in, you parenthesize it. So, we substitute it in a 4. That looks good. We substitute it in a 3. Oh, well, that doesn't look good. Does everybody see that when we tried to substitute in the 3, then 
Okay, it lost its negative. Okay, we substituted in a negative 7. Right, let's, let's use green for this. A negative 7. Does that look good? Yeah, that looks good. We substitute in an 8. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so then from here, it's just arithmetic. So that's what? Uh, 7 squared and then plus negative 15 squared. So that one's 49 and that other one's 225. So that's 274. And I'm not interested in you factoring things out of the radical and all that. We did that in chapter one. As far as I'm concerned, that's fine because this is why we made machines, right? To do that kind of thing for us. Any questions about this? Okay. <coughs> Good. So another matter. midpoint. Here again we have the case in the line. And here again we have two points. A and B. And I've not drawn the origin so you don't know if A is positive or negative or you don't know anything about them. All you know is that B is more than A. <coughs> So now what I want is I want you to, to indicate the point that is on the line that is exactly halfway between A and B. Okay, specifically, I want a point that if I was to make, a, if, if we were to cut A and B, if we were to cut this line segment, it'd be two equal pieces. So is that the midpoint? No. Is that the midpoint? No. All, right. All humans are, are very good at finding the midpoint. It's about right there. Now you might wonder why are humans good at finding the midpoint? Okay, why is it such a useful task? Well, there's lots of reasons, but here is here's one of the here is one of the main reasons. And when I say all humans can do this, I I really do mean all. So once once children develop the coordination to be able to do anything with a fork, they can cut something in half. Because you can do the following experiment. You can say to two children you can take a large piece of pie and say, guess what? You both get a piece of pie. And then you tell the one child, you get to cut the pie. And you tell the other child, you get to choose who gets which piece. And then both of the children think about it for just a moment. And then you will witness a child, like a scientist, cut that piece of pie right down the middle. Because they know that they know the score, right? They all know the score. We, we all know the score. You can cut it in half. Okay, now, what's the formula for cutting in half? Average, right? So let's think here for a moment. What is the midpoint of 10 and 20? <coughs> 15. What's the midpoint of 20 and 80? <laughs> hesitation there, but okay, 50. What's the midpoint of negative 3 and positive 14? Some people I can see. <laughs> yeah. Some people I can see like, I don't even think there is one. <laughs> so 10 and 15, most people can do that one pretty quick because the numbers line up. However, most people, when you ask them to compute the midpoint between 10 and 20, they say, well, there's 10 integers between 10 and 20, and half of that's 5, so I'm going to take 5 and I'm going to add that to 10, and that's 15. So the midpoint's 15. And that works pretty good for 10 and 20. And then you try and do the same thing with 20 and 80, and then it's like, uh, wait. Uh, <laughs> and then you ask them to do the midpoint between negative 3 and positive 14, and then it's just, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> After that. So rather than doing it that way, Please use the formula. So what's 10 plus 20? 30. Divided by 2 is 15. What's 20 plus 80? 100. Divided by 2 is 
50. What's negative 3 plus positive 14? 11. And then divide by 2 is 5 and a half. Right? <coughs> Good. So now, it's the exact same story in the plane except multiplied by 2. And by that I mean you just do the same procedure twice. So then, here's a point, here's a point, here's the line segment connecting them. And what we want is we want a point that's halfway between these two and divides the line segment in half. So we want that point right there. However, our rules state that we're not allowed to turn rulers sideways. That's against the, the rules. So then all that we can do is the same thing that we did before. So we'll bring this down. To measure that, we'll bring this down. To measure that, and we could say, oh, that's on the horizontal axis, so I could measure those. And then we'll turn it sideways, and we'll measure these. And so according to the previous rule for the one-dimensional case, we can come up with the midpoint here. So this midpoint is, x is again, the average, x1 plus x2 over 2. This vertical midpoint is here. It's the average, y1 plus y2 over 2. <coughs> so what's the punchline then? We didn't want that point, and we didn't want that one. We wanted that one. So what's the punchline? Right, so now we found this point by dropping down and this one dropping down and making this one, so now let's bring it back up. There. And. There. So to find the, the coordinates of a midpoint, the midpoint is <coughs> the midpoint of each individual coordinate. Okay, so he did an example, right? Good, so I'll just leave it there. Now, here's where I have to do something that will probably disturb you. Okay, but the nature of the disturbance is that there's two separate ideas that almost all students, when they come into college algebra, they think they're a single thing, and now I have to carefully separate them, and it's going to feel a little disgusting for a minute. So... Let's consider the following. So here's a mathematical statement, x squared equal 9. I think that um, there probably won't be any objection when I call this an equation. Okay. And I think also there will probably be no objection when I say that this is an equation in one variable. Because there is a variable, exactly one variable, and what's the name of that variable? X. So this we refer to as an equation in one variable. So now, equations in one variables, you can do a lot of fun things with them, but among those things, and one of the most common, is to perform a substitution. So if we were to perform the substitution, we'll substitute x is equal to 3, then what does that mean? What am I requesting for you to do? 3 where x is in the equation. Right. Replace every x with a 3. So then we'd get 3 squared equal 9, and then we could perform that arithmetic, and what's the new left-hand side? Nine equal, and so the new left-hand side is 9, and then 9. Probably there's no real surprise or objection here. So now I'm going to do something different. I'm going to say, okay, now let's substitute x is equal to 4. When we do this, we get 4 squared equal 9, 
and then we, when we perform the arithmetic, we get 16 equal 9. Already some people are starting to be uncomfortable. <clears throat> so now I have a question for you. Is this an equation? Yeah, that's an equation. Is this an equation? Yes. <laughs> now here we're at maximum discomfort. <laughs> yes, this is an equation. It is. Now, the discomfort that, you're, that you may be experiencing is that you know that, in fact, 16 is, is, is not the same value as 9. And I agree with that entirely. But that's not the question that I asked. I asked, is this an equation? And the answer is yes. Because an equation is a mathematical statement that has a left-hand side, a right-hand side, and an equation symbol in the middle. So is this an equation? Yes. Is that an equation? Yes. Is that an equation? Yes. So, is that an equation? Yes. Is this an equation? Yes. <clears throat> now, equations can be evaluated. And when you evaluate an equation, the equations have exactly two possibilities. They either evaluate to a value referred to as true, or they evaluate to a value referred to as false. And this is called the logical value of an equation. Now, what is the logical value of this equation? True. What is the logical value of this equation? False. This is an equation. Its logical value is false. There is nothing immoral or unethical about this having a false logical value. It is still an equation. So, is this an equation? Yes, and it is logically true. And is this an equation? Yes, it is logically false. <coughs> so, that means that when we plug in 3, we obtain an equation which is logically true, and when we plug in 4, we obtain an equation that is logically false. So in this class, and in most math classes, and in most science classes, you're, in, you're, you're interested in, whenever you get an equation in one variable, you want to know all of the values that you could plug in and obtain logical truth. One of, one of them, at least this, this equation has at least one such value that you plug in and get logical truth. It's 3. Is there another? Negative 3 also works, for reasons that I suspect are obvious at this point. If you plug in negative 3, you also get an equation which is logically true. Are there any other values? No. So, so I'm not going to say why there aren't any other values, because that's just a little bit beyond the scope currently. But, there, for this equation, there's exactly two values, 3 and negative 3. What is the set of all values for which the set of all values such that when you plug in one of these values you obtain an equation that has a logical truth. That's a mouthful, isn't it? What's the name for that set? It's called the solution. The solution of an equation in one variable is the set of inputs which result in logical truth. Okay. And that's all that we have time for today. So have a nice Monday.